Hi folks, hope you're okay today, it's good to be with you. My website's jasonburnspreacher.com jasonburnspreacher.com and it's good to be with you. I'm just going to pray. Dear Father, we ask for your forgiveness and mercy today and we pray that you bless this video uh, for your glory, Lord, in your name. Amen. Amen. I've got to go out in about uh, 20 minutes, so I'm just going to do a video. Uh, I'm going to visit an elderly gentleman in hospital and also uh, I've got uh, a Bible studies to do later on so but it's raining and so I've got a few minutes to to um, make a video and I want I want to make this video I think it's an important video and I hope it's a help to people first thing I want to say is it's really encouraging to see people at Hyde Park uh, did I tell you my website jasonburnspreacher.com jasonburnspreacher.com but um, it's really encouraging to see that there are a number of Christians at the moment getting stronger and stronger in bringing arguments to Hyde Park and that's really encouraging so keep up the good work um, the first thing, main thing I want to say is if you're going to go down to Hyde Park we've said this before and we we'll keep saying it again go prepared when I go out to Hyde Park down to Hyde Park I, I go prepared I, I studied the Muslim apologists meticulously, I have notes in my Bible and I go prepared um, and uh, you know if you're gonna go to Hyde Park as a preacher or to reach out study the Muslim apologists, study their arguments, go to Answering Islam, Answering Muslim, Muslims websites go to uh, listen to David Wood, Sam Shimon and others and do some research and study and um, even go to the Islamic sources like answering uh, Christianity uh, or islamicawareness.com or whatever they, they are and find out what the Muslims are saying um, listen to uh, Christian debaters like Nabil Qureshi uh, Sam Simone and David Wood um, and James White uh, on when they're dealing with Islam and debating with uh, Muslims and learn from them so that's really really important um, please please go and be prepared prepare yourself I spend about two days intensive study before I go down to Hyde Park um, so you know go prepared please go prepared now try and work together as a team try and work together there are a lot of young Christians that go down there who are on holiday and they just enter into debates and they've not prepared themselves you need to be more humble and think well where are the Christians who are going down there who are debating every week we'll go and support them so go and support them go and help them go and encourage them and learn from them rather than go down without any preparation and cross swords with Mansour or Hamza, you're going to get yourself in a mess, all right. So please, please either prepare yourself or go and join the Christians down there and support them. Um. So that that that's an important thing. Prepare yourself. Work with others. Um. Then I want to talk about the issue of vice, what I would call the vice. If you turn to uh, Matthew twenty four thirty six. Muslim apologists and missionaries are brilliant at getting you into a vice. So here's how to deal with the vice. Matthew twenty four thirty six. It says, "But the day and the hour knoweth no man, nor the angels or heaven, but my Father only." So here's the vice. The Muslim apologist, the Muslim missionary, will say, "Here, ha ha." Uh, they'll say, is is Jesus, is the Father God? Yeah, is Jesus God? Yeah, is the Holy Spirit God? Yeah. Well, it says here in 36, Matthew 24, 36, But at that day and hour knoweth no man, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Only the Father knows. So Jesus can't be God, and the Holy Spirit can't be God. And then you, you look at it and you go, oh, all oh, right. Uh, so, you'll try and say oh well you know Jesus is God no look at the text look at the text look look it doesn't say he's God you said uh, 
the Father's God, Jesus is God, the Holy Spirit's God. But look, look at the text. The Son and the Holy Spirit don't know they are, they're not God. Look. Right? Now, they've got you in a vice. Because what you're doing now is you're looking at the text, but you're not looking at the context. You're not looking at your biblical theology and your systematic theology and what the whole Bible says. So we know in the Bible, in John chapter 1 verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So we know in the Bible, from that passage alone, that Jesus is God. But what they, they won't let you look at that passage. No, they'll go, no, no, answer the question, answer the question, answer the question, and, and, and you'll be struggling. And, and what they've done is they've got you in the Islamic vice. I call it the Islamic vice. And what that Islamic vice is, is their hermeneutic is the Quran. And they're using the Quran to interpret that verse. And what you're doing is you're submitting to the Quranic interpretation of that verse. Alright? Now what you need to do is realize that if you just study the context of that passage. And look at that passage in the context of Matthew. In the context of Biblical theology of the New Testament and Old Testament and your systematic theology that you'll be able to have an answer so for example your biblical theology you have uh, Philippians chapter 2 he made himself of no reputation that would be helpful for this passage all right uh, your uh, biblical theology of Matthew in the beginning of Matthew in the beginning of Matthew sorry about this In the beginning of Matthew, you have the Trinitarian formula of the baptism. The Father says, I'm well pleased with the Son. And then you have uh, the Spirit come down. So you have Father, Son and Holy Spirit there. And then at the end of Matthew, you have in Matthew 28 verse 19. In Matthew 28 verse 19, you have go in the name of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. So at the beginning and the end, we have the Trinity there. So when, they, when he's quoting, or the person's quoting Matthew uh, 24, um, 36, But if the day and of the hour knoweth no man, not the angel of heaven, but my father only, and say, look at the text, look at the text. They're getting you into the Islamic vice. You should be thinking, wait a minute. I know what the beginning of Matthew says about the Holy Spirit and God. I know what the end of Matthew says, so I'm not going to be pushed into this Islamic vice. What I need to do is just look at this chapter in its context and how it relates to all the other biblical theology of the Bible. And not allow them to get you into that vice. And then the next thing you need to do is to say, wait a minute, you're interpreting this from an Islamic perspective. I don't agree with your Quran. Your Quran is not the right hermeneutic to understand my Bible. Your Quran is corrupt. It's got contradictions in it and show them a contradiction. So now what you're doing is you're prizing their hands off the Bible. You're, saying, you're like saying, touch not my anointed. You're not going to interpret my scripture with your Quran. No chance. Your Quran's corrupt. Throw them out some questions about the Quran, about the corruption of the Quran. For example, there are contradictions within the Quran. So go and do some research, find those contradictions. And, and just remember that they'll know the answers to them. So find out the answers to what their answers will be. But look at their contradictions and say, look, your Quran is not a source to interpret my Bible. And once you've got their mitts, their hands off the Bible, then you can interpret the passage according to the passage in the Bible itself. So if you go on to calm apologetics um, one uh, uh, the answer to that passage uh, in calm apologetics uh, Matt Slick's calm apologetics if the Holy Spirit is God this is the title if the Holy Spirit is God why didn't he know the time of Christ's return so Matt Slick says puts the scripture Mark 24 36 and Mark uh, Matthew 24, 36 and Mark 13, 32. But of the day and of the hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. Mark 13, 32. But the day of the hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. 
And he writes, there are two possible answers here. First, Jesus is both God and man. John chapter 1 verse 1 and 14. John 20, 28, Colossians 2, 9. And during his ministry in Jerusalem, he was cooperating with the limitations of being a man. As a man, Jesus walked and taught. As God, he was worshipped. Matthew 14, 33, 28, 9. Hebrews 1, 6. Pray to Zechariah 13, 9. 1 Corinthians 1, 2. This is called the hypostatic union. Since he was operating as a man under the law, Galatians 4.4, 4, it might very well be that Jesus was referencing the Father as the proper sovereign, as only as a, a good Jew would have done. Second, cultural context is very important, so this is the second possible answer. This passage is about Jesus' return, including getting the bride, the church, and then the wedding feast would occur, Revelations 19.7.9. Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made himself ready. And it was given to her to clothe himself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. And he said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. If we are to look at the cultural context, we can get a much better understanding of what Jesus was, was Jesus may have been alluding to when he said that only the Father knows. In that historical and cultural context, when a man was going to marry a woman, it was usually prearranged. The bridegroom would be living with his family and he would begin to build an addition unto his father's house, where he and his future wife would live. It was the custom for the father of the home to be one who designated when the addition was finished. This meant that only the father knew when the son would be told to get to the bride. But does this mean that the son would not know when he had to go to get the bride? Not necessarily, and this is why. A wedding was a community affair where many, many people would be invited. This required advance notice so that people could allot the necessary time to attend the wedding and the wedding feast. This means that some would have to put their animals away for the day, not work in the field that day, not have business dealings that day, etc. In a culture where there is no internet, phone or radio, things were done well in advance so that people could plan ahead. Furthermore, a wedding feast also meant that large amounts of food would have to be prepared in order for all the guests to have something to eat. These kinds of arrangements were not done on the spur of the moment. The arrangements were done weeks, sometimes months in advance. Therefore, to alleviate anyone missing the wedding feast due to a spontaneous invitation, that they could not attend, arrangements were made well in advance. But in order to maintain the respect and dignity of the father's place in the home, it would naturally be said that only the father knows when it would be time for the son to get the bride. This did not necessitate that the son did not know because the community would have, would have to know within a reasonable degree of accuracy when the wedding would occur. Therefore, Jesus may have been alluding to the phrageology housed in wedding and wedding feast culture that did not necessarily mean he did not know or the Holy Spirit did not know the time of his return. So what Matt Slick seems to be saying there is that uh, in the weddings that it was a kind of way of respecting the father uh, to say that only the father knows but in because in the wedding feast context that's what that's how it would be understood. So there's two answers one is using uh, the kind of philippians passage of two he made himself of no reputation and then the cultural context and if you actually read uh, matthew 24 there is quite a bit about bridegroom and marriage within the passage anyway so it's not forcing the interpretation it's actually within the context of the chapter so those are some possible answers but they're both using techniques of, of, of the Bible. One technique is the context of the Bible, the historical and cultural context. And the other context is biblical theology using other aspects of the Bible. All right. Now, those answers might not satisfy you, but the point is, is if you grapple with the text and look at the context and look at what the Bible says, you will get answers. I think these are two reasonable answers to that question and they're not forced they're in the bible now you're not going to be able to give these kind of answers you're not going to be able to respond to these answers if 
you uh, are not um, if you're not gonna um, if you let them get you in that vice if they if you let the Muslim apologists get you in the vice and say no 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 they'll just go no 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 look at the text it doesn't say that look at the text it doesn't say that or you say well let's look at the context then and they won't want you to do that let's forget your Islamic interpretation let's look at the context of the text no 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 look at the text you see they're getting you in a vice you say, no, let's look at the context of the text. And what you're doing there is you're pushing them off with their Islamic interpretation and getting back to what the Bible says. And when you say, no, let's look at the text because your Quran is corrupt, it's not correct, it's not a way of interpreting the Bible, it's got contradictions in, throw that in and then get back to the Bible. All right. I'm going to just put a, a video on uh, on this topic which will clarify even more. Sorry about this. So it's not happening here. Sorry about this, folks. I'll, I'll get. I will get to. Uh, get there folks I'm looking for the video on a guy called inspiring philosophy uh, and he's I don't agree with everything he believes in theistic evolution but he's very good uh, apologetic videos for some reason my computer keeps We will get there eventually. I'll see if I can get it on my phone. Sorry about this, it's, but it's really uh, a good video. So. It's with it. We'll see. We'll see. If we can get some of it on here for you.
We'll get there folks, don't worry. I want you to see this and this will help you a bit more on this topic. So you've got Matt Slick on there. Right, here we are. This is inspiring philosophy. Why didn't Jesus know the hour of the tribulation and the Olivet prophecies? In Mark 13, 32, Jesus says, But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. In this verse, Jesus says that only the Father in heaven knows the hour when these events will happen. But this verse appears to contradict the doctrine of the Trinity. If Jesus is fully God, then shouldn't he know the hour as well? It appears as though he is less in ontological status to the Father and cannot have access to certain pieces of knowledge. However, there are possible answers to this. Most Christians respond to this by pointing out that Jesus was both fully God and fully man. And during his earthly ministries, prior to his resurrection, he willingly cooperated with the limitations of being human. He suffered hunger, he had to sleep and rest, and he felt grief and pain. Jesus was fully man, and yet he was worshipped to, forgave sins, and claimed divine eternal status with the Father. This is the hypostatic union. Christ had two natures, and during his earthly ministry, he cooperated with the limitations of being fully human. Of course this is because he is divine, who became fully man. Hebrews 2.9 says, For a little while he was made lower than the angels, so that he could suffer death for everyone. Philippians 2, 6 to 7 says, Jesus was equal with God, but willingly emptied himself and became human. So the scriptures teach us Jesus emptied himself, and thus suffered with the limitations of being human, which many surrendered properties like omnipresence and omniscience. This is seen in the fact that Jesus spent years learning and educating himself. And it also explains why Jesus didn't know the hour when that tribulation would occur. Jesus cooperated with the limitations of being human, and wasn't fully omniscient. However, after his resurrection, he was once again in full glory with the Father and was omniscient and omnipresent. So this is the answer most Christians give. However, there are problems with this explanation. That is not to say that it's incorrect, just that it doesn't explain everything. The most notable is the fact that in Mark 13, 32, Jesus says only the Father knows, but why not the Holy Spirit? If the Holy Spirit is fully God, then shouldn't he know as well? Why wouldn't Jesus say the Father and the Holy Spirit know the hour? Well, some have tried to answer this by suggesting that perhaps the Holy Spirit willingly limited his knowledge as well. But this almost seems ad hoc. Is there any answer a Christian can give on this? In fact, yes, there is. If we look at the entire passage this verse comes from in Mark 13 and Matthew 24, and if we look at the cultural context, a different picture emerges of what Jesus was actually alluding to. In ancient Jewish cultures, marriages were almost always prearranged. After arrangements were made, the young groom would begin building additions onto his father's house where he and his future wife would live. The custom was that the father of the groom would decide when the additions were finished and was ready for the young couple to move in, which meant only the father knew when it was time for him to get his bride. But this doesn't mean the groom actually didn't know when the time was. A wedding was a bigger event in those days than it is even today. It was a community-wide event. This meant people would have to plan for them far in advance and set aside time from their usual daily work. Dates would need to be known weeks before so people could adjust their work schedules for the wedding. Food would also have to be prepared in advance. There was of course no refrigeration or supermarkets, so arrangements for food needing livestock and crops were planned well in advance. Everyone would know when the time was getting close, as the traditional wedding food would need to be ready and prepared. However, despite it being obvious to everyone when the wedding would take place, in order to give respect to the father of the groom, it would naturally be said that only the father knows when the groom was going to get his bride. But obviously the groom would not have been unaware of the day or the hour, as it would have been obvious to everyone in the community. So with this in mind, a new understanding of Matthew 24, 36 and Mark 13, 32 can be seen. Jesus was not claiming that he or the Holy Spirit did not know the hour of his return, but was explaining that what the events leading up to the tribulation would be like. It would be like that of an ancient Jewish wedding, where everyone would know it's drawing near and the Father will give the word for it to take place. But the events leading up to it will be seen and understood by all. If we look at Mark 13, 32 in context, we see it actually makes more sense with this understanding. Prior to saying this, Jesus gives another example of how we will know when the tribulation will take place. He says to learn from the fig tree. As soon as its branches put out its leaves, you know summer is near. So also, when you see these taking place, 
you know that he is near. Likewise, Jesus then gives another example by alluding that it will be like a Jewish wedding, when the father will give the word for his son to get his bride. So he borrows phraseology from a Jewish custom. So it is likely Jesus wasn't saying he truly doesn't know, but that he gives respect and authority to the Father to give the word when these things will happen. But he and the Holy Spirit would know, just like the community knows when the wedding will take place. As we said in our video which explains the Trinity, the doctrine of the Trinity says the Son and the Spirit submit to the Father's authority. Jesus was simply reiterating that here, and explaining the events leading up to the tribulation will be like that of the events leading up to a Jewish wedding. Amen. So that, so that is... Um inspiring philosophy why didn't jesus and the holy spirit know the hour inspiring philosophy is a really good uh youtube channel um with good apologetic material on i don't agree with his theistic evolution i, I don't agree with that i think he's made a mistake there but he, he, he produces really really helpful material on, on other things as well so so the point is the vice they will try to get you in a vice Answer the question. This is the verse. No. And you say, well, let's look at the context. No, no, no. Read the verse. Well, let's see what the Bible, whole Bible can say about it. No, no. Read the verse. And all they're trying to do really is they got you in an Islamic vice where they're using the Quran as their interpretation and they've got you to think from a Quranic perspective if you go with them. And you say, no, <coughs> let's look at the context. Because the Bible interprets the Bible. We don't use your Quran. Your Quran has been corrupted. It is not the word of God. It's got contradictions in it. Throw that at them. For example, it says creation is in six days. And then it says eight days. It says um, it says uh, six generations and eight generations. Make up your mind. There's contradictions. It's not reliable. The Bible interprets the Bible. Oh, look here. It talks about bridegroom. Couldn't that be a way of understanding this passage that the custom was to give respect to the father and maybe that's what jesus was just doing giving respect to the father oh how did we get that we got that through reading the context not from your islamic exegesis all right so get out of the vice don't let them ever get you into that vice they will always do that and entrap you uh so that's the first point that that's one of the main points the next point that i want to talk about is um, the argument that Muslims use concerning um, Isaiah 42, 1 to 11. So, uh, I use the King James, but I've, I've, I'd use the King James there, but I'm just going to use the NIV because it, it's just convenient. Isaiah 42. So, they'll get you an advice here. <coughs> Isaiah 42 is a typical one that Muslims use. Isaiah 42, verse 1 to 11. Here is my spirit whom I uphold, my chosen one whom I delight. I put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout nor cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break. A smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he, faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged. Till he established on earth in his law the islands will be put their hope this is what the god of the lord says you created the heavens and stretched them out and spread the earth i the lord have called you in the righteousness i will take hold of your hand i will keep you and i will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the gentiles to open the eyes of the blind i am the lord and this is my name i will not give my glory to another sing to the lord a new song his prayers from the ends of the earth, you who go down to the sea and all that is in it, your islands and all who live in it, let the desert and its voice towns raise their voices, let the settlement here where Kedar lives rejoice, let the people of Sailor sing for joy, let them shout for hope mountains, let them give glory to the Lord and proclaim his prayers in the island. The Lord will march out like a mighty man, like a warrior he will stir up the zeal uh, with a with shout he will raise the battle cry and will triumph over the enemies. So the Muslims will say that this is Muhammad and they will go to the verse 11. Let the desert and its town raise their voices. Let the settlement here, Kedar, and, uh, and lives rejoice. 
and they'll say oh well that's Shane that is Prophet Muhammad that he's gone to Qadar which is um, a symbol of uh, Arabia or Arabian people and um, the reason why Muslims if you read this article uh, the prophecy of Isaiah 42 Jesus or Muhammad by uh, Shibli Zaman Shibli Zaman and it's on answering Islam and um, the reason why Muslims pay attention to that passage is because um, in Bukhari in in the hadiths uh, if you look at Isaiah 42 and compare it with Bukhari's hadith um, you have Isaiah 42 1 behold my servant whom I behold my elect in whom my soul delighteth I have put my spirit upon him he shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles so that's Isaiah 42 1 um, and in Bukhari 3 3 3 5 you are my servant and my messenger I have named you all Mutwaki meaning the one who depends on Allah Bukhari 3 3 3 5 so if you are actually to do a study of Isaiah 42 and Bukhari in Bukhari uh, 3 chapter 3 verse 3 3 5 there's very similarities between Isaiah 42 and the hadiths uh, in Bukhari concerning saying it's Muhammad and uh, so Bukhari is using uh, Isaiah 42 now the thing is the reason why the Muslims use this Isaiah 42 because in Bukhari and the Muslim apologists will say this is a prophecy uh, that um, the Muslims didn't have uh, in the time of Muhammad Isaiah 42 so how did uh, how did uh, they know about this this is just nonsense it's obviously blatantly obvious that um, that the the that Isaiah 42 was around in the time of Muhammad and, and was around in the time of ba Bacardi for Bacardi um, um, to, to use it so that that's just a silly argument and uh, so that's why they see this this kind of passage is important because it's quoted in the hadiths right so you know you wonder they're not just going to it because of the exegesis they're going to it because it's got reference in the hadith so So um, the, the Christian guy is answering some of the apologetics here. So he gives a refutation and he says this. In this section we hope to accomplish the following objectives. The identity of the servant according to Isaiah. The rabbic, rabbinic interpretation of Isaiah 42 and the two New Testament application of Isaiah 42 they, the identity of the servant according to Isaiah Isaiah 42 is not only the servant passage in the song there are many references to God's servant some of which refer specifically to the nation of Israel Isaiah 41 8 to 16 Isaiah 42 18 to 25 Isaiah 44 1 to 5 and 21 to 23 Isaiah 45 verse 4 Isaiah 48 20 other passages clearly speak of an individual and these passages which concern us here in this discussion furthermore certain things said about the servant of Isaiah 42 are also said of the Messiah King supporting the position that the two are actually one and the same individual here are the beginnings of Isaiah 42 1 to 7 here is my servant whom I appalled I will put my spirit in on him and will bring justice to the nation. He will not shout or cry out and raise his voice in the streets to bruise reed. He will not break, etc. Then you go to Isaiah chapter 9 verse 1 to 2 and 6 to 7. And so so he, he points out, sorry, in um, Isaiah 42, he points out, Till he established justice on earth, in his law the islands will be put their hope and in black and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles. 
So in Isaiah 9, verse 1 to 2, we read, You will honour Galilee of the Gentiles, black a light has dawned. Uh, it will be called Wonderful Counsel and Mighty God Everlasting Peace. Of the increase there will be no end. He will reign as David's throne and over his kingdom. So he's, he's showing that the word servant has reference to Israel, but it has reference to this person uh, who is a king. Isaiah 11, 1 to 5. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse, from its root to branch of the fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and of power, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and he will del delight in the fear of the Lord. So in Isaiah 11, 5, 1 to 5 and 10, the same kind of language is the same as 42. And you could go to Isaiah 49, 1 to 10. You are my servant, Israel, in whom I will display my splendor. He who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him and gather himself. My servant to restore the tribes of Jacob. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles. Isaiah 52 verse 13 and 15. See my servant will act wisely. He will uh, be raised and lift up highly exalted. Just as there were many who were appalled at him. His appearance was so disfigured beyond it that of many and his form marred beyond uh, human likeness so will he sprinkle many nations and kings will shut their mouths because of him Isaiah 53 1 to 12 he grew up like a tender shoot uh, he was smitten etc uh, and then other prophets uh, bring in that the Messiah is the son of David Zechariah 3 8 my servant the branch Zechariah 6, 12, 13, here is the man whose name is the branch, and he will branch out from his place and build the temple of the Lord. Jeremiah 23, 3 to 6, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up to David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right. This is the, the name by which he will be called the Lord our righteousness. Jeremiah 23, 5, 6. Jeremiah 33, 15, 16, I will make a righteous branch branch sprout from David's line he will do what is just and right in the land he says the writer amazingly the Messiah is not only a son of David but he is Jehovah God our righteous himself echoing Isaiah 9 6 7 where the Messiah King is called the mighty God the rabbis hold that this title branch has designated the, the Messiah from this later let's summarize the data regarding God's servant Number one, he is a descendant of Jesse through the son of David. This proves that God's servant is an Israelite, not an Arab. Number two, he is called Israel as distinct from the national Israel. This provides additional proof that the servant is an Israelite and not an Arab. Three, he is the mighty God and eternal king. Four, he is empowered by God's spirit. Five, he will restore the nation of Israel. Six, he will be a light to the Gentiles and the saviour of the entire earth. Seven, he will be a covenant to the people. 8. He will bring a law which all people will follow. 9. He will, be, will at first be rejected and despised by, the, by both the nation of Israel and other nations. 10. He will offer himself a sacrifice for sin. 11. He will see offering and carrying on the Lord's will. He will see offspring and carry out the Lord's will. And 12. He will intercede and justify sinners. Now the rabbinic interpretation. Earlier Zamanic he, this is the he's critiquing the Muslim apologists earlier. Zaman excitedly appealed to the rabbis to show that the Arabic language was na named after Kedar, Lashon Kedar. Since the rabbi rabbins excited him so much, we present their view regarding the servant identity, following the quotes that are taken from William Webster's superb "Behold Your King: Prophetic Proofs That Jesus Is My Messiah." Messiah. Christian Resources, 2003, page 239. 242. Western book can be purchased at uh, christiantruth.com. Uh, the Midrash and Psalm 2, verse 9. The Midrash says, In the decrees of the prophet it is written, Behold, my servant shall prosper. 
He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high, Isaiah 52, 13. And it also written, Behold my servant whom, whom I behold, my elect in whom my soul delighted. In the decree of the writings it is written, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand, until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Psalm 110, 1. And it is also written, I saw in the, the night vision, and behold, there came with clouds of heaven, one like a son of man, and he came to the Ancient of Days, etc. Um, so in other words, um, expounding Psalm 2.9, it links in with Isaiah 52. Uh, and it says, Who will fulfill them for the Lord Messiah? So the rabbis are connecting Isaiah 52.13 with the Messiah when they're expounding Psalm 2.9. And the rabbis applied Psalm 2, verse 7 and 8, Psalm 110, 1, Isaiah 42, 1, Isaiah 52, 1, 13, Daniel 7, 13, 14. Midrash on Psalms 42, 43, and verse 5. For what didst thou the redeemed of our fathers in Egypt? Was it not from the oppression wherein the Egyptians oppressed them? Of which God said, Wherefore I have seen the oppression... Exodus 3 9 for me to life is nothing but oppression by my enemy then why must I go about myself mourning under oppression of the enemy <coughs> didst thou not send redemption at the land of two redeemers to that generation as he said he sent Moses his servant and Aram who he had chosen Psalm 105 26 send two redeemers like them to this generation or send out thy light and thy truth let them lead me Psalm 43 3 <coughs> Thy light being the prophet Elijah and the house of Aaron, which it is written, The seven lamps shall give light in front of the candlestick. Numbers 8.2 Here it is. And thy truth being the Messiah, son of David. As it is written, The Lord has sworn in truth unto David, He will not turn from it. Of the fruit of the body I will set upon thy throne. And then... So it mentions there in the Midrash, the truth being the Messiah, son of David. And then later on it says, and speaks of the second Redeemer in the verse, Behold my servant whom I uphold, Isaiah 42, 1, Psalm 42, 40, 45. In other words, this Midrash, expounded on the Psalms, mentions that Jesus, that the Messiah is the son of David and uses Isaiah 42, 1. That's nothing to do with the prophet Muhammad. And there are more, you could read more on, on what the rabbis say. So now we look at the application of Jesus. We've looked at Old Testament prophets, we've looked at the Midrash of the rabbis, and now we look at what Jesus says. The New Testament shows that Jesus' life and ministry perfectly fulfilled Isaiah 42, as well as a, a host of other messianic prophecies. Matthew 12, 15, 23. Aware of this, Jesus withdrew from the place, many followed him, and he healed their sick, warning them not to tell who he was. This was a fulfillment of what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. Here is my servant whom I have chosen, one whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him. Matthew twelve fifteen twenty three is Jesus is quoting, the Lord is quoting Isaiah forty two, one to eleven. So there the Lord is interpreting that passage according to um, to himself and uh, the writer goes into intricate detail concerning concerning this conclusion the elders from Isaiah the rabbis and the New Testament all point to the servant being the Messiah the New Testament and the Quran both agree that the Messiah is Jesus, which means that Muhammad cannot be the servant spoken of by Isaiah. Zamna needs to misapply, uh, misapply uh, I think, Genesis and read into Isaiah his gross eisegetical errors and Islamic presuppositions regarding Islam, Muhammad being a prophet of the true God. Isaiah 42 says nothing about the servant being a Kidarite or that he would speak in Arabic, but simply says that Kedar and all the nations would proclaim the prayers of the true God. 
The fulfillment of this has already taken place not in Islam, but in the church of the risen Lord and immortal Saviour Jesus Christ. Etc. So, that is um, a very excellent article which you can get from uh, Answering Islam. The prophet of Isaiah 42, Jesus or Muhammad, responding to Shili Billy Shibli Zaman. So it's responding to Zibli Zaman, not by Zibli Zaman. And the writer The writer is Sam Shimon and Josh Joe Chen Katz. Joe Chen Katz. Sam Shimon uh, Joe Chen Katz. And it's responding to Shibli Zaman, the prophecy of Isaiah 42, Jesus or Muhammad. Excellent little article. Now, when you're in uh, Hyde Park, and the Muslims say, oh, look at Kedar in Isaiah 42. That prophecy is about Muhammad. We can go to Genesis and look at it. And you're going to be like, what's that all about? You know, if you've done a bit of research, looked at what the prophets say about the servant in Isaiah and surrounding prophets. And then if you look at what the rabbi said and you look at what Jesus said, you get the true interpretation. But you don't need the rabbis, but... But that's just extra information. And then if you if you if you look at the book of Isaiah as a whole, study the book as a whole. Um in the book of Isaiah, his message means the Lord is salvation. He is the prophet of salvation, yet salvation and judgment always go together in the Bible. If you won't be saved, then you must be judged. So Isaiah compares these two themes in Judgment, chapter 1 to 35, and Salvation from Isaiah 40 to 66. These main divisions are linked by a historical section about King Hezekiah in uh, 36 to 39, chapter 36, 39. The date Isaiah's vision came to him during the reigns of four kings, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, uh, Isaiah chapter 1, verse 1. Uzziah died in 74 BC, Isaiah 6 verse 1, Hezekiah in 687 BC. These visions spread over half a century. Prophecy. Isaiah was a prophet, not merely a preacher, and the book is prophecy, not just history. Isaiah had visions, not just insight. Prophecy assumes that there is God and knows the future, who reveals parts of his plan to the prophets. Background. When Isaiah began his work, Israel was in the final stages of collapse in 72 BC. The northern kingdom with its ten tribes was captured by Assyria 2 Kings 17. But the southern kingdom, Judah, was heading for a similar fate and they were corrupt socially, politically, in their religious faith. The northern kingdom had been judged and had disappeared, but Judge Judah was different. She must be judged, but because of God's eternal covenant, she, shall, uh, she also be saved one day out of judah there would come the servant of the lord the savior to redeem not just judah but the whole world authorship and unity the author is named in isaiah 1 1 as isaiah however it's sometimes suggested that there are three main divisions isaiah 1 3 5 3 chapter 3 36 to 39 40 to 46 are by different authors a reason given including an apparent difference in style between isaiah 1 35 and the rest the appearance of the names Bel and Nebo, Babylon gods, and even the names of Cyrus, conqueror of the Babylon Empire, and Isaiah talk about a return from exile long before the exile itself. But the book itself emphasized God's ability to reveal the future. Isaiah 41, 21 to 27, 42 verse 8, 44 verse 6 to 8, 48, 1, 3. There is no manuscript evidence that two or more books of Isaiah exist, and no trace of other authors the New Testament quotes from all parts of the book and simply refers to Isaiah. So the writer here is acknowledging that in the scholarly world, there are academics who say there are three writers of Isaiah. But this writer is saying, no, the manuscript evidence shows there is only one Isaiah who wrote it. 
so outline division you have in the book of Isaiah chapter 1 verse 1 to 31 condemnation Judah the rebel chapter 2 verse 1 to 22 the day of the Lord the future judgment chapter 3 1 to 26 Jerusalem and Judah present judgment chapter 4 1 to 6 the day of the Lord the branch chapter 5 1 to 30 Judah a useless fruitless vineyard then you have in chapter 7 1 to 25 the sign of Emmanuel chapter 8 1 to 22 the sign of Isaiah's son chapter 9 1 to 7 the sign of the Prince of Peace chapter 9 verse 8 to chapter 10 verse 19 judgment Israel and Assyria chapter 10 verse 20 to 34 a remnant will survive chapter 11 1 to 16 a root a branch and a banner chapter 12 1 to 6 a song of salvation then we have in chapter 13 1 to 14 chapter 13 and chapter 14 to 23 woes against Babylon chapter 14 24 to 27 woes against Assyria chapter 14 28 32 woes against Philistia, Philistia. chapter 15 1 to 16 14 woes against Moab chapter 17 1 to 14 woes against Damascus chapter 18 1 to 7 woes against Cush chapter 19 1 to, to chapter 26 woes against Egypt chapter 21 1 to 10 woes against Babylon and chapter 21 11 to 12 woes against Edom chapter 36 sorry chapter 21 13 to 17 woes against Arabia chapter 22 1 to 25 woes against Jerusalem chapter 23 1 to 18 woes against Tyre chapter 24 1 to 23 woes against warnings uh, sorry a warning then we have uh, songs of salvation in um, chapter 25 verse 1 up to chapter 27 then in chapter 28 1 to 29 a warning to the north kingdom chapter 29 1 to 24 a warning to the southern kingdom chapter 31 to chapter 31 verse 1 to 33 a warning of the obstinate chapter 31 1 to 9 a warning to the political opportunist I'll, I'll tell you why I'm doing this in a minute chapter 32 1 to 8 the king and the kingdom chapter 32 9 to 20 the judgment justice and righteousness Chapter 33, 1 to 24, the exalted king. Chapter 34, 1 to 17, judgment and the nations. Chapter 35, 1 to 10, the kingdom of joy. Then we have the historical contribution. Isaiah 36, 1 to 22, Sennacherib threats. Isaiah 37, 1 to 20, Ezekiah's response. Isaiah 37, 21 to 38, Sennacherib's dealt with. Isaiah 38, 9 to 20, a song from Ezekiah. Uh, Isaiah 39 1 to 8 the messenger from Babylon so this section of Isaiah you have passages about holiness God is holy the Holy One of Israel Isaiah 1 4 Isaiah 5 19 Isaiah 5 25 24 Isaiah 10 20 Isaiah 12 6 Isaiah 17 7 Isaiah 29 19 Isaiah uh, call comes from God who is holy Isaiah 6 3 God calls to to Isaiah from a holy of holies most holy place Isaiah chapter 6 verse 1 to 4 although Judah must be judged a holy remnant will be saved Isaiah 6 13 Mount Zion on which Jerusalem was built to be holy mountain Isaiah 11 9 27 13 to be holy means be different to be set apart which is the translation of the Hebrew word holy in this verse Isaiah 23 18 the walk walk by God's people is the way of holiness one of the early labels given to Christianity was the way, Isaiah 9, 2, i.e. holiness. Righteousness is another theme in this section. Justice and righteous belong together. The man who is religiously righteous will be socially just, Isaiah 1, 21. Faith and righteousness also belong together. Faith in God leads on to bring the right with God, which leads on to being just, fair, with people, Isaiah chapter 1, verse 26. The Bible teaches that in the long run it will... It is well with the righteous, Isaiah 3.10, Isaiah 26.2. The, righteous is the righteousness is the characteristic of God's judgment. God is not influenced by man's wealth or position, Isaiah 11.3.4. Righteousness cannot be learned by people who are doing wrong, 
A man's good environment will not make him a good man, Isaiah 26.10. The reign of the Messiah will be a reign of righteousness, Isaiah 32.1. You have the... Um, You have uh, judgment as another theme in this section. Isaiah, consider this in two ways. Human judgment, we ought to be fair, open, honest in every case. Isaiah 1, 17, 21, 26. Isaiah 5, 20 to 23. Isaiah 10, verse 1 to 4. Isaiah 33, 13 to 16. God's judgment, this we cannot escape. It is God's way of setting the account straight and making sense of life and injustice. Isaiah 1, 24, 28. Isaiah Chapter 2, verse 6, 21, Isaiah 3, 13, 15, Isaiah 5, 18 to 30, Isaiah 11, 1 to 5, Isaiah 28, 16 to 29, Isaiah 33, verse 2 to 6. Then you have the day of the Lord. Um, the day of the Lord, Isaiah 2, verse 6 to 22, Isaiah 13, 9 to 22, Isaiah 22, 5 to 14, Isaiah 24, 1 to 23, Isaiah 2, Chapter 2, verse 1 to 5, Isaiah chapter 4, verse 2 to 6, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1 to 16, Isaiah chapter 12, verse 1 to 6, Isaiah chapter 14, verse 1 to 8, Isaiah chapter 25, 1 to 9. Application, the judgment and the love of God. The first part of Isaiah prophecy is concerned with judgment, and this is a regularly recurring theme in the Bible. There is Cain in Genesis 4. The flood in Genesis 7, Sodom in Gomorrah in Genesis 19. There is the judgment of Egypt in Exodus 12, the judgment of the Israelites in Exodus 32. And in the New Testament, we have the account of Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5, Herod in Acts chapter 12. I'll have to answer that in a minute. Revelation 20 etc. And yet many people and even some Christians find it hard to accept the idea of judgment. Isaiah makes clear aspects of judgment, present and future, temporary and eternal. Sorry about this. Sorry about that. I'll, I'll form back in a minute. Key themes. God in chapter 6. Chapter 6 recalls the vision given to Isaiah to show him clearly who God is. The vision. In verse 1 to 4. What are the characteristics of God as shown here? The response in 5 to 7. What is the significance of the live call?